The Return of the Mall Death Stalker Written and performed by Tony Capo Bianco. Six dead bodies had been discovered. Each victim was a beautiful young woman. Each innocent victim had worked in a mall. Marks on the throat had been evident on each corpse. The severe bruising had been caused by strangulation. One thing seemed clear. The mall Deathstalker had returned. Dylan Rottenborn, the notorious serial killer known as the Mall Death Stalker, had recently escaped from a maximum security prison. Stalking attractive women who worked in a mall and then murdering them by means of strangulation was his trademark. Law enforcement noted the obvious similarities between the Mall Death Stalker killings and the recent killings that occurred after Rottenborn had broken out from his incarceration. One glaring fact confused and troubled law enforcement. Though these young women had been strangled, strangulation had not been the cause of death. In addition to strangulation marks, each victim's throat had puncture wounds. The cause of death had been excessive loss of blood. Exsanguination had been the cause of death in each of the recent cases. As strange as the exsanguination of the body seemed, what was stranger still was the fact that most of the blood had been absent from the scene of the crime. Dylan Rottenborn had never done anything like that in the past. Had he evolved as a serial killer? Was this the gruesome work of the Mall Death Stalker? Law enforcement wasn't sure what the answers to these questions were. They speculated and came up with a number of different theories. One theory was that the recent killings could have been attributed to the infamous Tut, the Undead Terror Serial Killer. Tut notoriously drained all of the blood from his victims, and like the Mall Death Stalker, he too selected attractive young women to hunt. Tut, however, didn't specifically target mall employees, terrorize them over time, and then strangle them to death. His preferred method of killing was to hunt his victims and to cause them to bleed to death. His heinous activities occurred over the course of one night. Since the evidence of the recent killings didn't precisely fit the profile of either Tut or the Mall Death Stalker, the FBI posited that these killings might indicate a terrifying development. The FBI suspected that the two most infamous serial killers in the United States had teamed up. A killer collaboration between Tut and the Mall Death Stalker was a nightmare scenario. The speculation ended when the seventh victim had been found. On the wall, written in blood, was the message. I was imprisoned, but he set me free. I was lost, but in him and through him my true purpose is found. I was a weak mortal, but he made me a god. When I let him in, he transformed my mortality into immortality. Tut paints the colorless world red. A red tsunami of blood is coming. No one is safe. He is the bringer of death. He is the darkness that chokes out life. If you let him in, if you serve him, he may grant you death eternal and undead immortality. If you don't let him in, if you defy him, you shall perish in exquisite torment. He is the god of death and darkness, and the king of the undead. I am his dark disciple, now and forevermore. Signed, 
the undead Maul Deathstalker. The bone-chilling message confirmed the suspicions of Special Agents Lydia Marsh and Kono Castabello. This sinister revelation caused them grave concern. Dylan Rottenborn was dangerous enough on his own, and now that he had become a disciple of the undead terror, the danger had multiplied exponentially. The agents realized that Rottenborn had almost certainly become a vampire. While it seemed possible that Tut had merely broken the mauled Deathstalker out from prison and given him specific instructions to follow, it seemed much more likely that Tut had turned Rottenborn into his undead slave. Lydia Marsh was the reason that Dylan Rottenborn had been caught and imprisoned. She had unmasked him as the Maul Deathstalker when she was still just a young woman in college. He had selected her to be his next victim, but he learned that he had chosen poorly. He never stopped thinking about what he would do to Lydia if he got a chance for revenge. A burning rage had consumed him throughout his incarceration. Being free, he was determined to make her pay. Since the Maul Deathstalker had escaped from prison, law enforcement had been inundated by reports of stalkings. People were afraid. Fear and panic caused people to see the serial killer everywhere. Suddenly it seemed that every bizarre behavior of ex-boyfriends was conflated as being the work of the escaped serial killer. The huge volume of tips that were called in made it exceedingly difficult for the FBI and the police department to discern which tips were credible. Yet, diligent and painstaking work enabled law enforcement to narrow down a list of potential targets from thousands to around 30. Of those 30 possible victims, they narrowed it down to three young women. This was achieved by analyzing the threatening notes that the three young women had received. Each of the three young women had produced harassing letters in the handwriting of Dylan Rottenborn. The young women worked in malls in Pennsylvania, but none of them worked in the same mall. Eager to catch the mall Deathstalker, law enforcement sent officers to each of the three malls. Special agents Castabello and Marsh went to the mall that was closest to the university, while other FBI agents accompanied officers from the police department as they staked out the remaining two malls. All of the officers wore plain clothes in an effort to be inconspicuous. Agents Castabello and Marsh walked through a large mall that's located to the east of the university. Being a Friday evening, it was busy with a lot of foot traffic. The three-story mall was packed. The two partners casually walked around the first floor. Many teenagers laughed and were customarily loud. There wasn't anything strange about that. Ever since big indoor malls had been built, it seemed that teenagers had been drawn to them like zombies are drawn to brains. Luckily, the agents had no reason to expect a zombie outbreak at the mall. Instead, they vigilantly looked for any sign of the mall Deathstalker or vampires. As the agents passed a beautiful indoor waterfall, they climbed the escalators to the second floor. The delicious smell of freshly baked pretzels wafted through the air. Castabello stepped towards Pretzel Place. Marsh grabbed his arm and raised her eyebrows in disapproval. Castabello, in return, raised his eyebrows and said, This is what people who aren't low-key hunting vampire serial killers do when they come to the mall. Marsh squinted her eyes a bit and replied, So, it's not just because you're hungry, and because you want to feed your bottomless pit of a stomach? Smirking, 
Castabello said. I'll never tell. With pretzels in hand, they continued to stroll around the second floor. They arrived to the clothing store that was across from the chocolate store where one of the girls who had received threatening letters worked. Marsh was especially careful to blend in, because she didn't want Dylan Rottenborn to identify her if he was there. Castabello walked into the chocolate store to check on the young woman. Everything seemed to have been normal. There had been no trace of the serial killer. Castabello left the chocolate store and rejoined Marsh as they began to walk towards the food court. They were free to roam around because they had placed two undercover MMD Moon Mist Division agents disguised as employees at the card store. Additional agents had been disguised as custodians. A middle-aged man who worked at the pizza stand looked right at Castabello and said, Kono! The dead and breakfast is alive! It wants you! This is for you! The man then raised a pizza cutter and violently slashed the throat of a customer. Screams erupted in the food court. This wasn't the sound of kids playing around. These were terrible, blood-curdling screams. The panicked crowd ran out of the food court. Castabello and Marsh pushed through the frightened mob of people. They were like two fish swimming up a powerful stream. A motionless body, collapsed on the floor, was engulfed in a pool of blood. That kind of blood loss meant that the young man was dead. Marsh checked the man's vitals and called for an ambulance. The deranged manager of the pizza store ran to the back room of the store. Castabello fought his way through the panicked crowd, leapt over the counter, and followed the madman into the back room. The piercing eyes of Castabello became dilated as he saw that two employees from the pizza place had also been murdered. One victim had been stabbed in the eye with an ice pick. The top half of the other employee was stuffed inside of the pizza oven. The smell of burnt flesh caused Castabello to gag. He cleared the pizza place and went through the back exit where the employees typically took out the garbage and started to search the back corridors. It was eerily silent. Suddenly, a cry called out. The homicidal pizza man had thrown a young female employee from another restaurant against the wall. He took his pizza cutter and slashed at her. The girl's arm had been sliced open as she had defensively raised it. The psychopath restrained her right arm with one hand while he raised his pizza cutter with his other hand. Just as he began to whip the weapon down, two shots were fired. Castabello shot the attacker in the back. If he had fired a second later, the girl's neck would have been sliced open. While Castabello and Marsh dealt with the bizarre and gruesome murders in one mall, law enforcement patrolled another mall. Officer Greg Swick worked undercover as a custodian. He kept his eyes on Lisa Cunningham who worked at a jewelry store on the second floor of the mall. This two-story mall had high glass ceilings that enabled a terrific view of the Pennsylvania sky. On that particular night, the light of the moon shone through the huge sky window. At 8.31 p.m., Officer Swick noted a man in a long black hooded trench coat as he walked toward the jewelry store. Officer Swick talked softly as his earpiece transmitted his alert message to the rest of the police officers and FBI agents who stealthily monitored them all. The man in the black hooded trench coat walked up to the counter, stared at Lisa and said, Hello, pretty young thing. 
I've been looking forward to this, and I can tell that you're excited too. I hear your heart beating like a drum. Lisa's eyes about popped out of her head as she asked, Is... is there any particular necklace or earring that you're interested in? I... I like the purple diamond pirate ship necklace myself. Pirate was the safe word that alerted law enforcement that she was talking to the Mall Death Stalker. The Mall Death Stalker answered, You're the piece that I'm interested in, and I'm gonna get it. Stop where you are and put your hands up! You are surrounded by the FBI and the Midtown Sheriff's Office, said Officer Swick. Undercover officers sprung into action. One police officer had been posing as a clerk in the next-door store. In addition, ten officers emerged from the surrounding stores. An FBI agent had emerged from the railing. She had posed as a mother with a baby stroller, but instead of housing a baby, the stroller carried a lifelike doll, and it had concealed weapons. Several more FBI agents emerged from the crowd. The hooded figure slowly turned his head and scanned the surroundings. He then lunged toward Lisa, who had run toward the police officers. Several police officers raced toward the suspect and threw their full weight into tackling him, but the combined force didn't budge him an inch. The hooded figure grabbed one policeman by his shirt, lifted him up off of the floor, bit him, and ripped out his throat. He began to drink his blood as it gushed out like a river. Gasps and screams echoed throughout the mall. Law enforcement opened fire. The bullets didn't stop him. They barely seemed to have any impact. A large crowd of people looked on in disbelief from the above balcony. The black-clad demon drank his fill, and then, with an unnatural speed, he began to slaughter the officers one by one. Fountains of blood sprayed up into the air. It was a most ghastly scene. Officer Swick grabbed Lisa by the arm as he ran with her to take her out of harm's way. Albeit, he didn't know if any place was safe from whatever that thing was. In his twenty years on the force, he had never seen anything like that. He knew that what he had just witnessed was impossible, and yet he had indeed witnessed it. Everyone in the mall saw the extraordinary events. Whether or not anyone would get out alive to report what had happened was uncertain. The only certainty was that a real-life monster was mauling a large police presence. As the vampire mauled Deathstalker tore through the bodies of the police officers and FBI agents alike, a member of the MMD pulled out a crossbow and fired a wooden arrow into the bloodsucker's chest. The arrow missed the mauled Deathstalker's heart, but it did make him drop to the floor. Another agent took a wooden stake out from the baby stroller and approached the killer vamp in order to finish him off. As the agent got closer, he had been picked up and lifted into the air. His arms and legs flailed wildly. A grotesque, Grayish, demonic face with large fangs grinned as this second vampire flew through the air. It was Tut, the master vampire. Though the fiend had no wings, he flew through the air like a giant bat. He carried the FBI agent with ease. Once he had ascended to the sky window, he ripped off the FBI agent's head. A torrent of blood sprayed onto the window. The decapitated head plummeted to the floor with a sickening thud. 
the moonlight shined and caused the blood-covered sky window to glow red. The remaining police officers and FBI agents frantically fired upon the undead beast. Once again, their bullets didn't appear to phase the monstrous creature. The crowd of people had thought that they were safe on the second floor. They had been gravely mistaken. Some people ran in absolute terror, and some became paralyzed by fear. The master grinned as he soared through the air and said, Good, good. I can smell your fear. I can hear your hearts pumping the terror-filled blood through your veins. You are all going to taste so delicious. You will give me a pleasure that you'll die for. Swooping down, the master plucked one victim up after another. He toyed with some of them before he drained them of all their blood. One moment, he would walk slowly and methodically as he hunted down the remaining members of law enforcement, and the next... He'd run as fast as a flash of light as he disemboweled an innocent civilian. Then, when he pleased, he'd return to terrorizing people through flight. The mall Deathstalker, having been saved by the Master, bit into the neck of a victim and drank every last drop of the life-giving blood. The fresh blood worked quickly as it began restoring his health. He went from one victim to the next until there was no living body left. Both he and the master had entered into a euphoric feeding frenzy. The killing spree had intoxicated them beyond description. Dylan Rottenborn had never felt a high like that before. He was so strung out on the blood and by the godlike killing that he had forgotten all about his original target. Lisa had escaped with Officer Swick. They reached his car and drove away from that death trap as quickly as they could. Officer Swick called in for backup as he drove toward the rendezvous point set up by Agents Castabello and Marsh. The secret rendezvous had been planned in case things went bad. Things not only went bad, but in fact, all hell had broken loose. The casualties from the Mall Massacre were in the hundreds. Nothing like this had ever happened before. Never before had a vampire slaughtered so many people in a public setting. It was a total bloodbath. The lucky civilian survivors were traumatized for life. They couldn't believe what they had seen, or what they had been through. None of the victims would ever be the same again. By the time Castabello and Marsh arrived with backup, the master and his apprentice had departed into the night. What the two vampires left behind was a trail of terror and a message. Written in blood on the moonlit sky window were the words, A supernatural red army rises. Submit to me and worship me, or perish and become food for the gods. This is only the beginning of the transformation. Signed, Tut, the Undead Terror. I hope that you enjoyed your stay here at the Haunted Half Moon Inn. The Master requests that you consider supporting me and the inn by becoming a slave. I mean, a patron of mine on Patreon. The Half Moon Inn needs your support to keep the doors open. 
You wouldn't want the residents here to feel forgotten and abandoned, would you? Creating quality scary stories to share with you is very important to me. Running this inn of horror is a passion of mine, and I would truly appreciate your support. The world is hurting. It needs more horror. Help me to heal the world through horror. Together, with your help, we could haunt this world one home at a time. Until next time, always remember, just because you don't see them doesn't mean that they aren't there.